Amen. Number 70 is our final, or our first song, our first song, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Number 70, grab a book and be ready and watch the screen above me at the appropriate time. Brother Ed Lee, the minister at Cedartown, will be conducting our opening prayer at the appropriate time. And Brother Kelly Staggs from Waco will be conducting our closing prayer at the conclusion of our service this evening. Many of you have asked, do we have any more books on the way? Yes, they are here. We have about 36 more of these Muscle and a Shovel books. Our cost is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 16 bucks. If you want one, see either myself or Joyce tonight. She'll be in her office through the hallway here, the first door on the left after services. If you want one, we have about 36 of them that arrived last night. So we do have some of these available for you this evening. Without any further delay, let's enter into our worship service, and if I could ask you to stand, we'll join in singing number 70. I appreciate that compliment. I, I uh, smelled it, but I didn't swallow it, brother. <laughs> that was me over here earlier. Number 70, let's sing out. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, we'll sing all three verses. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heaven, praise His name. Praise Jehovah, and in the highest, all His angels, praise proclaim, all His souls together praise Him, sun and moon and the stars all Oh. 
before our prayer this evening, number 139. 139. Sing verses 1 and 3, and then we'll have our prayer. Let's sing it. Master, the tempest is raging, the billows are tossing nigh, the sky is overshadowed with light. together, please. Our Lord and our God and Father in heaven, so grateful are we that we can gather here this night, that we can gather, Father, to hear your word proclaimed in love and in truth, in a world, Father, where there is much chaos, where there is sin that abounds, where much false teaching is taking place. And Father, sometimes we grow weary, weary of these things. And yet, Father, in a night such as this, when the elders of this congregation have set aside this meeting, have brought forth a speaker that will speak the truth with boldness, will preach the full counsel of God, will preach your truth, Father. And may that truth be heard this night, and may we carry it forth as we listen to these things that our brother is bringing to us that we might go forth boldly, Father, knowing that we can do all things through your Son, Jesus Christ, who strengtheneth us. Father, as we listen tonight, may we not only be hearers of this word, but be the doers, obeying your commands. Father, as we go into this world in which we live to fight that good fight of faith, may each soul that is here tonight have a fire rekindled within them, that we might go and to be able to teach and to preach to others, to this world that is lost and that is dying in sin, to this country of ours that has lost sight, has lost its compass towards thee, Father. May we come back to thee. May we strive always to do your will. Defeat us, Father, when we do those things that are wrong in your sight. May we always seek your truth and your wisdom and your guidance. 
Again, Father, we're thankful for the elders of this congregation and this congregation and the many good works that they do. We pray, Father, that the congregation here will live long and do well in thy service. And also, Father, for this brother that comes to preach to us tonight, Brother Brinkley, that he will have a long life in your service, that he will continue to de get, dedicate himself to your truth and let nothing stand in his way of proclaiming that great gospel which has been given unto us to go into all the world. Father, it is at this time we ask that you accept this prayer that we offer in thy son's holy name, for it is in his name that we do pray. Amen. At the invitation this evening, we'll sing number 161, 161, if you'd like to mark it. And before the lesson, number 417, 417. We can sing all three verses, we just have to sing them fast, okay? Let's sing. I'd like to stay here longer than men's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I live with Him forever in glory. say welcome again to everyone, especially if you are visiting with us. We encourage you to open your Bible, open your hearts, and study with us tonight. As Brother Eddie Brinkley preaches the gospel to us. Mentioned last night, uh, I was uh, in a kidding way that sometimes if somebody says something about a sports team or something, and you know, we, we let them know we take offense at that, or I disagree with them about this team or that team being better, and of course something like sports, that's subjective anyways. But there's one thing that's not subjective, and that's the gospel. And so we, we don't, I think I speak for any member here or preacher here. Uh, if, if there's something that we disagree with, then we need, to, uh, we need to talk about that. We need to discuss it and find out what the Bible says, because that's what's going to judge us in the last day, John 12, 48. Uh, we've had it all this week. We've just had a great, great week. Uh, I wanted to mention something that I, I didn't get a chance to show this earlier, Brother Brinkley, but... Uh, we got a 21st century sheet chart sermon. Somebody told me when they got here Sunday morning, said I hadn't seen a sheet chart sermon in years. But it was, it was small. Some of the folks in the back, we were afraid, might not be able to see it. So uh, go ahead, Brother Jake. 
There's uh, the, the sermon Sunday morning, running from a lion met by a bear. I was mentioning that last night. And then let me show you when we went to Backwoods to eat Saturday evening. Brother Brinkley was met by a bear. <laughs> it caught him off guard a little bit. He was running from the lion, but he was ready for him by the time it was over with. He was, he was going to do battle with the bear, same as he did the lion. He took care of that Sunday morning, Brother Brinkley. Brother Brinkley, as we mentioned several times, trained at the feet of the great Marshall Keeble, great evangelist of the Lord's Church. And uh, Brother Brinkley is proud to be called one of Keeble's preacher boys. That's the way he often referred to him. Or, or also he would sometimes say, these are my samples, samples of the school and of his training. And what a fine sample Brother Brinkley is. Brother Robert Woods was able to be with us tonight, or was able to be with us last night. He's not going to be able to be here tonight. Hopefully tomorrow night he's going to try to come. That's another one of Keeble's preacher students. I've told Brinkley before, I said, if he's one of Keeble's boys, then I'm one of Brinkley's boys, I reckon. <laughs> and uh, I was thinking about something that uh, Brinkley was telling us. Uh, he's told me this a couple of times, that Brother Keeble was, he was stern, very strict. And for the young men to get to go out with Brother Keeble, you had to be very uh, ahead in your studies because you would be gone for weeks at a time. I didn't have any of this Sunday through Thursday meetings. They, they did two, three, four, five, six weeks. <laughs> they just preached till the, till the well went dry, I guess. But you had to be ahead on your studies. And so uh, Brother Brinkley told me, I remember it so well, Brother Brinkley, you telling me about coming in one day. And, and there was always a buzz around the school when Keeble came in from one of his preaching tours because that meant that a new set of fellows was going out with him. And you hope it would be you. So Brinkley said one day he got called in. And uh, the guy's talking to him. He says, well, how's school going, boys? And, you know, everything's going all right. You're doing well in your studies. He said, well, pack your bags. You're going with Keeble. He said, boy, that was exciting. So, uh, but he said he was strict. And, and sometimes he'd have these, these young men, and they'd come up and give a talk or quote a long passage of Scripture before him. And he said, sometimes... A fellow might get caught telling a lie or something like that. And Brother Keeble would have to get on to him pretty hard and said the fellow would be up on stage with Keeble that night. And he'd say, you know, this is, this is Eddie Brinkley from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and this is so-and-so, and tell where he's from, and, and this is Brother so-and-so. And he'd tell where he's from. He'd say, but now he's not going to be talking to us tonight because he's got to learn to quit telling lies. <laughs> and, uh, and he would do that to him. So uh, I was going to give a little short talk tonight, but Brother Brinkley says that i got to learn to quit eating so much. And then he let me give a talk for him. <laughs> we have really thoroughly enjoyed having Eddie Brinkley with us. And if you haven't heard him before, you're in for a treat. Uh, he does a masterful job presenting the gospel, but what makes it so special is that it is the pure gospel of Jesus Christ. Brother Brinkley, I'm not going to take any more of your time. You come preach to us. I'd like to begin this evening by expressing my appreciation to uh, this church, to his eldership and deacons and your fine minister. I'm enjoying immensely being here and being in Chad's presence and reminiscing over things that we went through with and also uh, just he's such a knowledgeable young man and zealous in the cause of Christ. It's just a pleasure to uh, be in his presence. I want to thank the brethren that preceded me by way of the songs. Brother McDaniels is doing a super job. He not only knows how to sing, you can tell uh, by the way he leads the songs and pitches them that he, he's not uh, shallow in it. He definitely knows what he's doing. And uh, it's beautiful when a cappella music is being made, when we're singing and knowing that that's the kind of music God authorizes, and then when you do it the best you can, it is beautiful, beautiful indeed. And I hope someday to hear, hear this kind of singing in heaven where all the saints of God be gathered together. I thank you for leading our songs. I, I didn't catch the name of our brother, Brother Lee. I want to thank him for going to the throne of grace and I hope and pray that if God will just answer part of the 
wonderful things, requests that he's made to the throne of grace. If you just God just answers a few of those things, while well, we'll all go down from this place tonight richly blessed. I want to com compliment the presence of not only members from various congregations, but also uh, the, the ministers that might be in the audience. I wonder how many gospel preachers do we have here tonight? Just, just raise your hand, let me see. Oh man, that, that, look at here, that, that, that's wonderful. Well, I know how you, you guys feel as gospel preachers. We gospel preachers, we are somewhat like roosters. Yeah, yeah, you know, when one rooster crows, if some more around, they all want to crow. <laughs> That's all right. And, and uh, that may be just a little comical, but it, it is true, we're like roosters. And another thing about roosters, I don't care where they come from, they all, uh, gospel preachers, we're like roosters, they all speak the same thing. I don't care if you bring one in from France. He'll strut around the yard a little while, and after a while he'll say, cock a doo doo <laughs> Then one from Europe, he'll strut around a little while, and he'll say, cock a doo doo They all speak the same thing. And I'm excited uh, to have them in our audience. Last night, uh, I was able to see Robert Woods, one of my old associates, companions back in the early NCI days with Brother Keeble. And I was happy to see a young man here tonight that I was just surprised and happy to see, and that's Brother Brown. Yeah, Brother Brown. Uh, I don't know if he's still in Atlanta or what, but it, he used to uh, preach at a congregation just 40, about 40 miles below me, Edna, Texas. And so, you know, we had great fellowship. Then he moved on up uh, to the, the state of uh, uh, Georgia and was at Atlanta. I don't know where he is now, whether he's still there laboring or whatever. But it's just thrilling to see you, brother. I am so happy to see you. And I'm happy for all of the congregations that are represented here tonight and the brothers and sisters of Christ. But above all, if we have any in the audience tonight that are not members of the Church of Christ, you are indeed our honored guests. And I'm hoping and praying that my lesson tonight will be very uh, uh, eye-opening to you and that you'll be uh, moved by it and... Uh, and that may be some, every now and then somebody tells me, say, so-and-so was here tonight or last night, and they've been coming quite often. They come a lot of times, but they have not uh, uh, responded to the invitation to the extent to come forward to render obedience to the gospel of Christ and be baptized into Christ. But I've been preaching uh, uh, so long, Brother Brown, I found out that a lot of people that attend the meetings uh, of the Church of Christ, they have the duck back syndrome. I don't know whether you know what that is. Uh, well, you, you, a, a duck, if you, if, you, if you know anything about them, that you, you can tell when it's going to rain before it ever starts. You say, how is that? Well, uh, the old ducks are beginning strutting around out the yard. You don't see no rain, but the, the neck almost like a rubber neck. And he'd be back there, look like he's scratching his back. But no, he's not doing that. He knows what he's doing. He knows that water is coming. He knows that it's going to rain. And he had down, down his back there, he have a little sack back there. It's an oily sack. Yeah, Y'all don't know nothing about that, but country folks do. Uh, he, and he, he goes, he rubber necks back there and puts his bill back there. You wonder what he's doing. He's oiling up. He's getting oil. And then he'll take and, and, and he'll fluff his feathers. He's oiling his feathers. And why is he doing that? Because he knows it's going to rain and he don't want to get soaked so he simply oils up so it would run off of his back. That way you get, you know, uh, running off the back like, you know, like a duck. And a lot of people do that. I found that in my experience that uh, they will come. I hope we don't have that syndrome here tonight. But uh, what they do, uh, they, they start oiling up before they even get to the service. They say, I'm going out there, but they ain't going to change me. I'm going to do this, that, and the other. I'll be there, but I know what I am, and I know how I feel, and can't nobody change me. And when he gets all oiled up, I don't care what you preach, just run off just like water right on the duck's back. And you can't get him. Uh, but uh, one day, people will wish they had given the word of God serious consideration. But I hope we don't have anybody here with that kind of syndrome, but I hope you're here with open ears and hearts, ready to receive with meekness the word of God 
which is able to save the soul. Now, uh, for our consideration this evening, I, 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 I want to deal with a, a question or a comment or an attitude uh, that the religious world has. And you that are members of the church and have to deal with this, uh, you need to give serious attention to this so that you might be able to deal with it and know how to deal with people who have this problem. Uh, we have, I don't know, in, in the thousands and thousands of denominations now, more and more of them, people are getting all kind of teaching. And, 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 and they even seem to know that they don't all preach the same thing, but that doesn't bother them unless you're very, very studious. You say, I heard this on sound. This guy said this and the other guy said it can't all both be right. I wish they would reason that way. But in order to be nice and, 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 and loving to everybody and everybody's church and everybody's faith, they have developed three serious blunders in matters of religion. And because that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight is, is these blunders that they make. They have some wrong ideas about the church. Uh, and uh, because of that, it's hard to get to them. Uh, it doesn't bother them that we have, oh, thousands of different denominations, probably right in this area, all different kinds of churches with different kind of names, different kind of doctrines. And uh, sensible people will think, say, well, why, why are we so different? But in order to be nice, most people fall into this category. They say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm going to name about three things that people say and believe uh, in religion uh, and, uh, and see if, uh, if that would stand up on the investigation of God's word. Uh, because there is a difference between the Church of Christ and all other churches. All of them. The Church of Christ differs from all other churches. And I want to show you uh, what that difference is. And the reason that most people do not think that the Church of Christ is any different from all the other churches, they have fallen under a, 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 an idea about the Bible, the church, and all of this. And they say, well, it don't matter what church you're in, what your faith is. Say, so after all, we're all worshiping the same God. And uh, somebody else might say, well, it don't matter. I don't go to this church. I go to such and such a church. But uh, my pastor preaches from the Bible every Sunday. We all got the same Bible. I don't see no difference in the churches. I just don't see any difference. And as I'm working on this difference thing, if I were to take a, if I would actually just take a subject, I, 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 it would be in the form of a question. Can you see the difference? I am going to show you the real major difference between the Church of Christ and all other churches. I'm going to show you uh, what that major difference is. And there's so many of them, I'm just going to select three uh, uh, major differences. And these three, I'm selecting them because uh, that's the common thing to do. And if you want to get along with everybody and go along with all the different churches, then if you come up with this, then everybody say, amen, you're right. Your faith, you're right. And we're all right. And one of them, as I said, they said, it don't make no difference how we worship. Y'all may worship different here in the church than where we do. But, but after all, we all worship the same God. And, and that's supposed to make it right. And, uh, and, and I wouldn't say that they're not worshiping. We're all not worshiping the same God. And another thing they say is that, uh, and then two, I noticed that my pastor, when he gets up, he preaches from the same Bible that you all in the Church of Christ do. So what's the difference in the church? We all uh, uh, worship the same God, and we all using the same Bible. Most of the churches are using the same Bible, and and, and of course, there is one. I don't know whether you would call that a, a Bible or not. Uh, uh, and I know the Jehovah Witness, they have what they call the New World Translation. And I've looked into that, and I wouldn't want to call that a Bible. I think it would be more, more accurate if they call it the New World Manipulation rather than translation because the Word of God is brutalized. But back to that, I want to get off into that. I, 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 but uh, people say we all worship the same God. And, and we uh, all use the same Bible. And say, we're all trying to go to the same place, heaven. And say, you go to heaven your way, I go to heaven my way. But we're all working toward heaven. And when that's said, 
that satisfies people's curiosity of thinking about why we got so many different kind of churches. To, and to, to deal with that, that's what they come up with, these three things. Well, anyway, always the same God. That's, that, that, that's, 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 we got that. Nothing. And we're all using the same Bible. All going to, working for the same heaven. And so for that reason, they say, then that uh, it don't make no difference. Just so you're in somebody's church, because all of this is the same. But now, what they're looking at, they're looking at where we are alike. But they're not looking at where we are different. That's like a coin. There's a head and a tail. There's one side got one thing on it and something else on the other side. And uh, what I want to show you tonight is that uh, this idea, if I can deal with these three, and, I, and uh, we'll be trying to use this blackboard a little bit. We're more used to that. But uh, one of the first one I want to call your attention to is that people say, well, uh, we all wish the same God. That, that's all that matters. Do you mean to tell me that just worshiping the same God is enough to make us right with God? If that's all that matters, then I got a case that I want to put before you found in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis. And most of you are familiar with this, where they're the first two boys, one was Cain and the other Abel. I think you know about those boys, don't you? Uh, and uh, what we got here is that in the process of time, these, these boys, we just put this little block up there, and, and then this is... This is, this is where God is at the very top. And then on this side, we're going to have one of the boys with Cain. And the other one was Abel. I think we spelled that right, A-B-E-L. Okay, now, people say it doesn't matter about us being different in our faith and all like that. We all wish we the same God, so that, 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 that's all that matters. You go to heaven your way, I'll go mine. Oh, wait, wait a minute, let's, let's stay right here and see if that's true. Uh, in the process of time, these boys, Cain and Abel, were required to worship God. Cain was a, was a farmer, uh, and he raised all kinds of fruit, Everything just says for fruit. And, and Abel was a shepherd. He raised, we just say, uh, that represents sheep that he raised. And, and don't, 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 don't get excited over this now. That's the representative. Of <laughs> you might say, well, that looks more like a don't say it. That's, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> this represents a lamb. This represents fruit. Now, these boys, in the process of time, God required them to worship. Cain, he took some of the fruit from the ground. I won't say it was the worst or nothing. I won't get into that. But he offered God some fruit from the ground. He offered it to God. And Abel, he offered God a, a lamb. But now the Bible says that God, uh, he, uh, he accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's. Wait a minute. Why would God do such a thing? We, people are saying, it doesn't make no difference. You know, uh, uh, as long as we worship the same God, that's all that matters, and, and God will accept it. Well, God rejected Cain and accepted Abel. What if it doesn't make any difference? Is God a respect of a person? Just, just kind of liked Abel better than did Cain or something? God is not in that respect of person business. But we do know this, that God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain's. If we, have, if we don't go any farther than this, we got a problem we got to work out. People say, it don't make no difference uh, 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 how you worship God, just as long as we worship in the same God. Was not Cain worshiping the same God that Abel was worshiping? If that's all it takes for us all to be right, why did God reject Cain and accept Abel? There must be some kind of reason for that. And when we find out what the reason is, it's not going to be about who they will worship. They had the who right. Am I right about that? They were worshiping the right God. But then the Bible teaches us uh, that uh, 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 Abel's offering was accepted. Is that right? But Cain's was not. And uh, why? Get to Hebrews 11 and 4. We'll get that right quick. I want to show you something. Why? We have to go all the way to the New Testament and find out what that was that made God accept Abel's worship and reject Cain's. 
because that's important. It's not enough just to worship the same God. We've got to have another element in there. If you leave that out, then God will reject you as surely as he did Cain. Well, 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 what is it, Brother Brink? Why did God accept Abel and reject Cain? Isn't that a good question? Hebrews 11 and 4. What does it tell us there? Notice it. It said, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, we're not discussing who they are worshiping. We're discussing how they are worshiping. Now, the reason God accepted Abel and rejected Cain, Abel had something in his offering that Cain left out. Abel worshiped God by faith. Well, what did that mean that Abel just... Got, got him a lamb and said, well, I just kind of believe this is what God would want. No, worshiping God by faith, according to the scriptures, Romans 10 17, what does it mean to worship God by faith? All right, what does it say, Romans 10 17? We can quote this, but come on, help me out there, little brother. Y'all know this anyway. Oh, Abel offered his offering by faith, and God accepted it. And what does it mean to do something by faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So what we have here is that Abel gave God what God required. Abel worshiped God and gave God what he wanted. God wanted him to give him. But what about Cain? His was not by faith. Well, what did he do? He just gave God what he thought would do just as well. As long as, as, long as I'm giving him something. Now, so then, if it took the word of God, doing what God said according to his word, to make Abel right and Cain wrong, doesn't that show you that just worshiping the same God is not enough? You've got to worship the same God in the same way. And if you don't have faith moving you through the word of God, then you're going to be to rejected. Now, I know you can, can see that. Yeah, I tell you what. People today that are worshiping God, just like Cain and Abel. We're all worshiping the same God, but where the Church of Christ differs from all other churches, we use the Abel method. And denominations use the Cain method. They're drinking from the Cain cup. What do you mean? Well, we just do whatever our pastors say. We feel like God wants this. That You can't please God that way doing what you want to do. You have to go to his word and find out what has he, does he require. And you have to give God what God asks for. And if you don't give God what he asks for, then he will reject you. That's why he rejected Cain. So the theory that just as long as we all worship the same God is all that matters. If that was true, why did God accept Abel and reject Cain? It was right in here. The word of God. And I tell you what, in, in churches of Christ, when we get ready to worship God, we don't just do whatever we feel like we want to do. Sometime in the denomination of churches, the pastor say, I don't know what we're going to do today. I just don't know when the spirit hit me, what we're going to do. And you can't tell what we'd be doing before we get. To. Well, I want to be in a church like that. I want to know what I'm doing. And I want to know that it's the word of God authorized me to do it. Because if I don't do what God said, if I don't have faith and the word to back up what I'm doing, God will reject it. And if I could get away with it, just do anything I want to do, and no Bible for it, and God has said to me and to Jimmy, well done, come on in, then he will owe Cain an apology. Am I right? Oh, I'm so sorry, Cain. I was awfully hard on you. You didn't give me what I asked for. You gave me what you wanted to give me, and I flat turned you down. But I've changed, Cain. I'm on... No, 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 no. God is still the same God. He requires you cannot worship God acceptably except by faith. And that faith must be undergirded by the word. Every act of worship in the churches of Christ that we offer God, we found that there are five requirements of worship uh, when we meet together. That is on the first day of the week for our regular worship. And every one of those things we make sure that we have. Did you know he requires us to sing? And because of the time, I can't go into a lot of details on it. If you, if you want to know more about it, we'll talk to you after the service. 
Uh, but uh, he commands us to sing. Ephesians 5, 19. Colossians 3, 16. Hebrews 2, 12. In the midst of the church, we'll sing praises to God. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual singing, making melody in your heart to God. Every verse in the New Testament telling the Christians what kind of music to make to God is singing. Every one of them is sing, sing. And there's not a scripture in the New Testament where the Lord commands us to play on anything. Well, why do we got all this playing on the pianos and, and beating the drums and all of that? People do it because they like the sound of it. But uh, uh, Cain might like the look of his fruit. But God is watching you do what he said like he said it. And God will reject worship. And that is not according to his word. Like I said, the, actually there are five items. We, we can preach on each one of these each, for a whole week. Come on. But he commands us to sing, Ephesians 5, 19. He commands us to have prayer. And in the prayer, he specifies, he said, I would that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. In the public assembly, when the church meets for worship, we all pray, but the men have to lead the prayers. I said, well, they don't do it in our church. Uh, we got my sister so-and-so. She's the mother of the church. And she, a brick, he, she leaves our prayer. I'm sorry, mother. God will not accept it. Is that right? Somebody, but she prayed so beautifully. I don't know how beautiful Cain's fruit was. But it was not beauty. It's obedience. You got to do what God said. And, and, and if you don't, he will reject it. It takes more than worshiping the same God to be right. You got to worship the same God the same way. And that's by faith. The word of God has to back it up. So because of time, I will not go into the details of these. We've worked some of this over, uh, you know, uh, another night. But those five items are singing, prayer, led by men. Somebody said, well, you mean y'all? Uh, the sisters can't pray. I didn't say they couldn't pray. They can't lead. They're praying, but they can't lead it. Can't get it, man. Y'all might have quiet on me. All right, now. Preaching. They had preaching. Teaching of God's word in the public assembly. It was to be done by men only. Let your women keep silent in the church. It's not permitted for them to speak, but to be in silence. Want to know anything? Let her ask their husband at home. Somebody said, well, I just think that's, I don't think that's right. I think the women ought to be able to do just what the men, if they, if, 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 if they have to pay, they ought to be able to preach. Well, when you jump in the gun here, this is not our worship, it's God's way. That's God's way. God got work for women to do, but it's not taking the lead. Women cannot preach. Not in the Lord's church. Let the women keep silent in the church. Suffer not a woman to teach you to use up the authority over the man, but to be in subjection. So we have singing, we have prayer, led by men, we have preaching of God's word, and that is led by men. And the Lord's Supper, we take it every Sunday. What church in, in this city other than the Church of Christ take the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Well, why y'all do it? That's just the way y'all do it. Yeah, no, it's not the way we do it. It's the way the Bible teaches. In other words, for a church to be right, you must worship God. And not just the same God, and that's all there is to it. The same God, the same way, and that way is by faith or by the word of God. We take it every Sunday. Acts 27, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, they took the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Somebody says, I saw that, but our pastor said he didn't say every. Well, he said, upon the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. He said, but he didn't say every. He didn't have to say every. I'm going to be talking about common sense another night. We didn't have to say. <laughs> if you went on a job and uh, after the man showed you what all he wants you to do and you said you could do that and he says and, um, you can start to, well actually you can start today. Uh, you say well, okay. And then he said oh yeah payday is Friday. I guarantee you one thing. Every Friday you're going to be standing out waiting for your paycheck. He didn't say pay, payday is every Friday. He said it was Friday. Well, what you doing showing up there every Friday to get your check? Because you know every week got a Friday. <laughs> Is that right? And as often Friday come, you waiting for your check. Every week has a first day. And that's the day that the disciples uh, came together to break bread. In churches of Christ, we have the communion every Sunday. And so where is our difference? Not in who we're worshiping. Baptist, Methodist, they're all worshiping God, but it's not in the who, it's in the how. Right. Right. And how? By faith. 
and faith comes by hearing the word of God. I could talk about the Lord's Supper and the giving, but I, I want to move on to several other things. But I just wanted you to see that, that as long as we're all worshiping the same God is not enough. We must worship the same God the same way, and it must be undergirded by chapter and verse for everything that we do. Anytime you walk in here on the first day of the week, and we're having our worship, you watch it, get your Bible open. You'll not see us do anything in our worship that the Lord has not told us to do. Why? Because that's the kind of worship that he would accept. Well, now, let me move on uh, to something else. And sometimes they say, well, uh, I don't see no difference. We, we all use the Bible. Our pastor used the Bible. He got a big old Bible, and first thing he does when he gets ready to preach, he opens that Bible, and he teaches us from the Bible. So I don't see why I should leave my church to go to the Church of Christ, because we got the Bible too. We all use the same Bible, and most of the time, without arguing about it, the King James Version or something like that, but we all use the same Bible. And so why? I said, uh, what? I can still go to heaven with you and say, wait a minute. If that's all it takes, is that we all use the same Bible, and that makes us all right, because we all use the same Bible. Well, I can find a case where, where, where Christ and the devil both use the Bible. Come on now. In the fourth chapter of the book of Matthew, there, uh, there, there was Christ uh, and there... Uh, uh, I was the devil, and the devil came to Christ, and uh, uh, he, he told Christ, said, you, uh, if you be the son of God, command these stones to be turned to bread. In other words, Jesus hadn't eaten for a month before today. That's a long time. And the devil knew that he being human as well as divine, but his humanity, the devil tried to get to him. And the devil said, why don't you make you something to eat? But Jesus was too smart for that. Jesus didn't come all the way from heaven to be a bread maker. You could stay in heaven and fed them. Didn't God feed Israel uh, those many years making bread? He didn't have to come down for that. He sent him down here that he might live that life and die that death. But anyway, all that's, uh, that's other stuff there. But the devil is true. He said, why don't you make you something to eat? And what did Jesus say? Jesus went to the word of God. He said, what did he say? It is written. Man should not live by bread alone. But by every word, oh, don't you see that? Don't you see that? Uh, uh, so here's what we got. We had the devil and the devil. And, 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 you know, and when the devil told Jesus that, uh, he, he didn't just say, make you some bread. And like that, he didn't just turn him off like that. Uh, I think he, is this the one where he gave him some scripture? Oh, yeah, it's that other one where he gave him some scripture. Yeah. Yeah, uh, he told Jesus uh, on one occasion there, he says, uh, he took him to a high pinnacle temple and said, now, if you're the son of God, uh, cast yourself down. Jump. For it is written. You know, the devil, he is, he is a rascal. When he first attempted to try to overthrow Jesus, he didn't use no Bible. He just said, make you something to eat. But when Jesus said, it is written. Man should not live by bread alone. Guess what the devil did? Next shot he had it, he started quoting some Bible too. That's the way it is. The devil don't like to fool with the Bible. But if he has to, he will. But you have to watch him because when he starts, he's going to misapply it. He's not going to have it right. That's the way it is in denominational churches. They're preachers. They use the Bible, but they use it just like the devil used it. Well, what do you mean, Brother Brent? Oh, Satan said to Jesus, it is written. If you cast yourself down, the angels of God will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. That was Bible. Wasn't it Bible? Did Jesus, oh, well, that's Bible saying, I guess I'll go on and jump. <laughs> Jesus made a statement that all faithful members of the church, and especially gospel preachers, we know this. It's critical not just to know uh, what the Bible says, get an understanding as to what it means. And you know what Jesus said to him? It is written again. Thou should not tempt the Lord thy God. In, in, in other words, there's more. You see, Satan wanted Jesus to just jump. 
give him that scripture. He didn't, he wasn't handling it right, but he did give him some Bible. But he wasn't handling it right. And he said, you know, it is written that if you jump, God's angels are going to bag you up. They'll catch you. He said, it's written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, God will take care of his servants if they're forced to jump or something of that kind. And if he said jump, then it's all right. But for the devil to say jump, Jesus wouldn't fall for that. What Jesus did, the devil smart. <laughs> Jesus outsmarted him. Jesus uh, let the devil more know this. Just not, not in just these words, but this is the gist of it. Wait a minute, Satan. There's more on this jumping than you tell him. You're holding back some of the jumping scriptures. <laughs> That's the way the devil does. He'll quote scriptures, but he will hold back some other part that makes the scripture make sense. You see, that's the way the devil uses the Bible. In denominational churches, you'd be amazed at how some of those preachers twist things and move them around and so that uh, they can make you think they're teaching the Bible when they're really twisting the scriptures. And Jesus says, it's written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. To make a long story short, he said, Jesus was letting him know that I, I only jump if God said jump. And God didn't tell him to jump. That was the devil telling him to jump. So he knocked him out with that. It is written again. And so then uh, we, we, we use the same Bible that the denominational people, most of them use. But then that's not enough. We use the Bible like the Lord used it. And they use the Bible like the devil did. You're looking funny. on. They do. They'll twist it around and make it mean something that it does not actually mean. And, 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 and Satan, he didn't quote that other scripture about, uh, you know, uh, don't tempt the Lord thy God. That went with it. In order to be a, a, a proper teacher of God's word, your preacher must make sure that he gives the whole story. He gives the whole of that. When he just gives some of it, that can be misleading. You got to give the whole story. And the devil is good is not telling it all. For example, if a sinner says, I want to be saved, oh, the devil will say through that preacher, well, all you have to do is believe, only believe. Acts 1631, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's what the scripture says, believe. But he's using that like the devil. That's not all the scripture said about being saved. Is that right? I'll talk about this another night. That was, I don't like to use them big words, uh, Brother Chad, but that, that uh, when he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, that's a synecdoche. And so it's I can't get into that tonight, but I'll get into that to another night. But I will show you this, uh, that uh, the devil is tricky, and he will try to get you off into something by telling you only part of it. And today, listen to the denominational preachers. If you want to be saved, all you have to do is to believe and he'll give you some Bible. When the devil told Jesus to jump, he gave him some Bible. Is that right? But Jesus does more jumping than you give him. And when these fellows say, all you have to do is believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and they should be saved. And you, we need to do them preachers just like Jesus did the devil. It's written again. That is more to being saved than just believing. Belief is on the part of it. Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That goes with it. And so a good, sound preacher of the gospel, he will take other scriptures that deal with that same subject so you can get the full understanding. Because you can tell something, somebody one part and don't tell the other, and you're still a rascal for what you've done. You say, well, why is that, Brother Brinkley? I'd like to illustrate. What do you think about this? Here's a guy. He stole a man's cow, I mean horse. Well, let's, let's back up. Let's use it like this. He stole this man's rope. He came to the man, and he said, for him, I said, I did you wrong. That's your choice rope. It was a new rope, and I stole it. Would you please forgive me? And he's crying, and the man said, well, all right, I'll forgive you. He says, you. You, 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 you admit you took it. I forgive you. But he didn't tell the whole truth. He didn't say a cow was on the end of that rope that I stole. <laughs> I think that makes a little more difference, doesn't it? Are right, you, 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 can, you, you can be a rascal with truth if you don't tell the whole truth. And the nomination of preachers, they're good at giving you some truth, but not the whole truth. 
The whole truth on being saved is not found in any, any one scripture. I don't believe you can find the whole plan of salvation in any one scripture. Talk back to me, brother. You know that's right. When you go to saying, you just do this. This one thing and you'll say, well, Jesus said he didn't believe he was baptized shall be saved. That was one of them things we call the synecdoche key. I got to stay away from that because I want to use that at another time. My point is simply this, that when preachers say we use the Bible just like you all do, we all using the same Bible, but then it's not only what you're using, that's correct, the Bible, it's how you use it. You see that? It's not on, only who we worship, and that's God, it's how we worship. The how you worship God is just as important as the who. Is that right? What are you doing, Brother Brinkley? I'm trying to show you, my friends, uh, that uh, the word of God can be handled deceitfully. You know what happened one time? Uh, I, I, it was, wasn't Brother Key, but one of the old pioneer preachers, Brother Bowser. Brother Bowser was showing this man that the only church that you can read about in the New Testament is the church of Christ. That's all you can read about. And this man, I don't mean any offense, but he was a Baptist preacher. And he says, well, our church is in there. Brother Bowser said, I want to see it. Show me where it's found. Because Bowser knew it wasn't in there. But one church in the New Testament, and that's the church of Christ. It's sometimes called the church of God, but that Christ is God the Son. But uh, he says, my church is in there. And you know, uh, the, the, this preacher handled the Bible just like the devil did. You have to watch these preachers. They'll have their Bible, but they'll use it like the devil, and you'll be lost at thinking you're following the Bible. But anyway, Brother Bowser said to him, son, now look, your church is not in the Bible. He says, yes, it is. He said, well, you read it for me. He said, well, he did. He said, in those days came John the Baptist. He just put the word Baptist up there. Preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And then had the nerve, after he got baptized out there, had the nerve to go to Mark 16, uh, 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 Matthew 16, 18, and where Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church. And he put the word church up there. <laughs> and he said, you see, now we got it, that's Bible. All that, that's handling God's word deceitful. This is the way those fellows do. You have to watch them. That's why you need to be a member of the church of Christ. We don't mess around with God. We let it stay just like it is. We leave it like it is. We handle the word of God correctly. Not deceitful. And so he thought he'd gotten away with it. He said, see? As Baptist, John the Baptist, he didn't put out Baptist. And then when Jesus said, I'll build my church, he said, there you have it. But the Bible said, well, if that's the way you're going to use it to prove the Baptist church. Let me work with it a little bit. <laughs> Brother Bowser said, let me hook on to this. Jesus said, he that believeth not shall be damned. So he put that on the back of that. Baptist church shall be damned. <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing was ridiculous, but when you start messing with and chopping up the word of God, you're going to ruin yourself. So that ended that. <laughs> I could stay there longer. But uh, maybe some other nights we can get to some more of this. I just want you to know that the devil, he uses the Bible, but he misapplies it. He cuts it off, and he, certain things he do not uh, uh, bring out to you. Uh, but you, you, but if you, as a member of the Church of Christ, that's, that's one thing we do. And that's why we have elders to guard and watch the congregation and the preachers. The preachers make sure that everything that we teach is rightly divided. We don't do no tricky stuff with the scriptures. What we say, the Bible backs it up. But in denominationalism, they got all kind of tricks that they pull. And what makes it go over is they use just enough Bible to twist it around to make it so. But we're not supposed to do that. So I got one other thing. Number one, we started out. How, how does the Church of Christ differ from the other churches? Not in who we worship. Oh, yeah, we all worship the same God. Well, why do we differ? In how. And I already showed you that the how is as important as the who with Cain and Abel. Is that right? And not only that, we are all supposed to worship the, the same God. And it's not that uh, denominational preachers don't use the Bible. They use it. 
But that's not enough for you to say, well, my pastor had the Bible. He puts it out there every Sunday. But how is he using it? If he's using it like the devil, then that makes it that much more dangerous. In churches of Christ, we let the Bible speak. What it says, what it speaks, we stand on that. And where the Bible is silent, we are silent. We don't add to it. We need to take from it. We leave it just like it is. That's the kind of teaching. That's the way that you can make it to heaven is when uh, you claim to teach the word of God and then everything that it says, you back it up. Because there are a lot, a lot of things uh, that if you just got a part of it, uh, you, you would think that you, uh, you, you can go to heaven uh, uh, because somebody quoted a scripture in the Bible about going there. Get the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. That's why when you go to court, then they have you there standing with the Bible and say, do you, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The whole truth. If that boy had told the whole truth, he'd have told about that cow on the end of that rope in the first place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Time is about gone. Let's look at another part. So the, the third thing that we want to consider, uh, that the Church of Christ differs from all other churches, it is cause not where we want to go. That's heaven. But that's what we all, all of us trying to go to heaven. Y'all trying to go y'all's way and we go out. We're all trying to go to heaven. We don't differ from you. We all are trying to go to heaven. Well, why do we differ? Not in where we're trying to go, but how we expect to get there. Am I right? The how is just as important as the where is. Am I right? Come on, y'all loosen up here. Can I get an amen every now and then? Uh, this, 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 this is why we differ in, 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 in how we're trying to get there. Jesus said, uh, John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Jesus tells us you can't get to heaven to the Father. He said, unless you come by me, that is by Christ. Churches of Christ, we use the by me method. Christ said, you got to come by me. And what did he mean when he said, you, you can get to the Father only by coming by me? Well, if you know the whole truth about it, Jesus, he came down here and taught the word of God and lived the spotless life and went back to heaven and God rewarded him with the kingdom. And then his church was set up on the day of Pentecost. Uh, and that made his church a part of your ability to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way. We can find, if time would permit us, to show that even his church is called the way. He is the way, and his church is the way. I want to go to heaven. You can't go to heaven unless you go the, the, the way that's laid out, and his church is the way. And, and uh, I think uh, it, it, it's, it's not hard to, to prove that, that the church, his church is the way. Uh, Let's see if I can get a little simple point in here on that, on the way to heaven and the church is the way. Uh, we just use our little illustration here to show you about going to heaven. Uh, Sometimes people say this. They say, you go your way, I go mine, we all go end up in heaven. After all, Right out there in Texas, this is the way they would argue this denominational preachers, Baptist, Methodist, most of them, they'd argue this way. They said, go into heaven. And I have to use Houston because, you know, I'm Texan and, and, and I don't know these roads and the numbers and all like that. So I'll just use my Houston method. They say, uh, it's just like this. Go into heaven. You go your way and I go mine. Don't fight people of other churches. They'll be there. You just go on and when you get there, they're going to be there because we're all headed to heaven and say, maybe they say, it's sort of like going to Houston. And see, I can use Houston because I know some of the, the highways and you know. They say, if a person wanted to go into Houston, uh, he, could, uh, he could come in or uh, say maybe on 45, that'll be coming in from Dallas. And, uh, and then he might say he coming in on 10, They'll be coming in from the New Orleans route, from Louisiana route. And he might uh, even say he's coming in on 59. My good brother doesn't know about 59. That's where when he was worship in Edna. Uh, 59, coming in from the valley way. 59, and coming into Houston. And, uh, and there is another one. Uh, I, I can't think of it just, just right now, but uh, uh, we, we might say 288. 
that's coming in uh, from uh, uh, the, the, the bay. Okay, and they said that's the way it is going to heaven. Some can, yeah, you go, go into heaven like this. Some come into Houston on 10. Some come in on 45. Some may come into Houston on 59. Some may come into Houston on 288. And that's all the way it is. Some go into heaven. Some come into heaven by the Catholic right. Some going into heaven by the Methodist right. Some going into heaven by the Baptist right. Y'all Church of Christ going into, church, into heaven on Church of Christ right. But we're all going to heaven. And you know people buy that. But there's only one thing wrong with that. It won't stand investigation. Won't hardly stand common sense. We don't get into that much. I want to talk about that maybe tomorrow night. But look at this. That may be true going to Houston. You can come in on all those routes. But man made Houston. Did man make heaven? Who made heaven? Ah, so if you're going to go to heaven, you're going to have to go God's route. And you search the scriptures through, and you'll find God said, I'm going to give my people one heart, one way. Jesus said, I am the W-A-Y. There is only one way to heaven. Isaiah, Isaiah 35 and 8, the highway shall be there in a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Unclean shall not pass over it. There is a way. And when it talks about heaven, there's no S on it. It's always a way. No S on it. No way to heaven. It's just a way. And so, since God made heaven, he didn't make but one way in there, and all of us, if we get to heaven, we got to go that same route. Now, to tell the truth, this will be a good illustration for denominational churches. This one here about Houston. See, because uh, you can go to hell any route you want to take. <laughs> Is that right? You can go in there, a whole monger, gambler, drunk, whatever. Anyway, you can slide in, walk in, <laughs> any way you want to. But going to heaven, since God made heaven, he didn't make but one way for us to get there. And I challenge you to find a way to heaven as an accountable person without going to Christ said, on this rock I will build. I'll build my church. And he said, I'm the way. If he's the way, his church is the way. One time they were persecuting the church. And the Bible says, I'm thinking about the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, they were persecuting those of the way. The church of Christ is actually called the way. It's the only way to heaven. And if you go to heaven, you've got to go God's way. So it's not enough that we all want to go to the same place. It's how we expect to get there. Jesus said, you've got to come by me. He said, well, that's the said, How do you come by Christ? One more simple illustration. That's the brother Keeble in me. I can't help but just do this. How do you get into Christ? When Jesus says, except you come by me, you'll not be able to enter. Give me an illustration, brother. Okay. Some of you young people. You hold it there, brother. You can read it, and then I'm coming right back. Okay, read it. Read. I'm the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. In other words, the churches of Christ, we're trying to get to heaven on the by me method. Jesus said you got to come by me. If you don't understand by me, I can make an illustration that any of these youngsters could easily follow. Suppose you, uh, school is just starting and, and you're a senior. Uh, and you're so happy to be a senior because you know it won't be long before you'll be getting out and finishing high school and and maybe you looking at your schedule and went to the class and you get your schedules and just looking at them. Who's going to teach this, that, and the other? And you pass by one old professor, a uh, teacher there, an old man professor. He's uh, uh, he, uh, kind of mean like. Most of them know he's kind of tough. And he said to you, say, boy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Say, are you a senior? Yes, sir. He said, mm-hmm. I thought so. He said, but you'll never graduate unless you come by me. Yeah, we got this by me thing. He said, you never graduate unless you come by me. Well, what did he mean by that? The boy would be barely misunderstanding him if the boy said, he said, I got to come. He said, by me. Okay. And the boy would kind of hide in a classroom right there at the hallway and see the old mean professor paper. And he'd run by and say, I came by you, so I'm going to graduate. Oh, no, I know you wish that was it. <laughs> oh, no. Several simple things. When that professor said you, you get, you'll never graduate unless you come by me, he meant several things. Number one, he meant that I have a class that I teach. 
Maybe it's a government class in government or something like that. And he's the only one teaching it. And when he says you can't graduate unless you come by me, then you're going to have to enter his class. Y'all talk back to me so I can wrap this up. You understand that? You got to enter his class. But just because the boy entered the class, that don't mean he's going to graduate. It's a, uh, they, he get in there and flunk the course and he still won't graduate. Am I right? When he said by me, he meant you got to enter my class, you got to pass my course, and when you do, you'll graduate. Well, Jesus, when he said no man come to the Father but by me, his by me is sort of like the professor's by me. No man can get to heaven. You got to come by me. Christ meant you got to come by me. Well, how do you come by Christ? Sort of like the professor in his class. Instead of having a class that you have to enter to get to heaven, you have a course you have to take under Christ. You got to come to Christ. You got to come his way. You got to come by his way. And when you enter his church, the professor had a class. Christ has a church. You have to enter his church. And just because you enter the church don't mean you go there. We, have, we may have a bunch of members of the Church of Christ here tonight that come hit and miss every now and then. They ain't living like you ought to live. you just here just because uh, they got a little something going on. And you're not giving as you should. You're not living like you should. Not attending like you ought to attend. Not trying to reach anybody. You're just taking up room in there. Well, you in the class, but you ain't going to graduate. To, to graduate, you have to enter the class. Pass the course, then graduate. In order to get to heaven, you've got to enter Christ's church, pass the course. Oh, we got a course. Oh, yes, we have. What did Paul say near the end of his life? Oh, Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my what? Course. Got to finish it, brother. Then just be in your warm and see. You got to be faithful and do the work that we're supposed to be to finish our course. And we will graduate. But that's the only way. If there's someone here tonight, say, well, I. I, I'm ready to enter. Simple steps by me. Hear the gospel of Christ. Got to hear it. Acts 15. Believe it. Repent of your sins, which is the hardest part. Mean quit your devilment. Been lying, quit it. Gambling, quit it. It don't mean slow down, get wet, come out of the water and start back up again. That ain't repentance. We have some trouble. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Brother Chad, we got some trouble with some members in the church. I ain't trying to hide nothing. We got some members of the church right there where I preach. They, they get up some Sunday morning and make a beautiful confession. Say, brothers and sisters, I have repented. And uh, I want y'all to forgive me and pray for me. And, and, and we do that and they don't even be back that Sunday night. Did they repent? No. What did they do? They reported. <laughs> what is that right? We don't need no reports. We need some repentance. Is that right? This old repentance, quit your devil, man. You got to do it if you're going to graduate. Hear the gospel, believe it, repent, confess the name of Christ before men. And we stand to sing this song, just come on down. And say, I can't, I see that. I, I, that's clear enough. And I see why the church of Christ is different from all other churches. We're not different in denominations of the Bible. We use it how we use it. Uh, we, we, it, 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 it it's, it's how we're trying to get to heaven. If you're here, I made it plain as I could. If you're here tonight, when we stand, you just start walking when we start singing. Just start walking. And if you brought a visitor member of the church, if you brought one of your friends, you, you never know what's going on in your friend's mind. But one thing you do, kind of stand kind of loose. And watch. They may need a little assistance. One of the worst things could happen, they want to come out and you got them blocked. Hey, we're trying to get them. Don't do that. Help them. Walk on down with them. And they say, I'll walk with you. And they make that grand confession. And then go down in the water of the grave of baptism. And when they come up out of the water of baptism, they're on the road to heaven. They're on Christ through his church. If you're here tonight, willing to come, we ask you to do so. While we stand, and when we start singing, you start walking. Let's sing. Oh, do not let the word depart and close thy
some here that almost persuaded or you should be do you realize that this church that we preached about it cost Jesus his very life he gave his life's blood to, to, to purchase this church so that you could come in and be faithful unto death and be saved and, 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 and to reject it you know Sunday we preached about uh, what all the Lord had to go through and how he suffered and died on the cross that we might be saved. I, 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 I heard a story once that shows me the beauty and the power of Christ dying for us. You know, you know what you be thinking about these little materials and earthly things. I'm going to wait till this or that and the other. But Jesus died for you. I'd hate to go to the judgment and explain to the Lord why he rejected him. What he did is so beautiful and so wonderful. Jesus is the Lamb of God. John said, Behold the Lamb of God. They come, you take away the sins of the world. I heard a story once about a lamb. Uh, uh, and uh, I want you to see what this did to that man. And that was just a, a, a literal sheep. And it moved him. But the Lamb of God died for you. I can't understand why that doesn't move you. Well, what are you talking about, Brother Brinkley? Uh, this man was an old country butcher. He, Everybody, they had sort of something that they wanted, you know, slaughtered, a, a pig, or whatnot, a chickens, whatever it was, they bring them to him. And he would. And one day, a man brought a lamb. Told him, said, I want you to butcher the lamb. But first of all, he, he never killed a lamb. He, he didn't hardly know what to do. But he had his job. And he started to sharpen his knife looking at the lamb. And that lamb just stood there. Didn't do a thing, just stood there in the teaching. If that had been a goat, they tell me, and a goat hears such noise like that, you he said, he, he knows you're fixing to cut him, he makes some noise. <laughs> he couldn't much blame the goat, but the lamb, this lamb didn't do anything. He just stood there. He said, well, he got his uh, knife ready. Instead of having to chase the lamb down, didn't have a lamb, to, the little lamb just staggered up there to him. I said, Lord, he said, he never seen nothing like this. And he did what he had to do. He took his sharp blade, he struck him under there and hit the juggler, and the blood came out all on his hands and everything. And said so the little lamb just stood there trembling, looking at him. And just before the lamb died, guess what the little lamb did? He staggered up there and started licking the blood off the man's hand. That man said, I ain't never seen nothing die like that. I don't ever want to kill another lamb. Well, now look, that lamb is just a literal little sheep. But Jesus, the lamb of God, came all the way from heaven 
down in the sin cursed world and surrendered when the soldiers came to get him. They came to get him on. Who are you looking for? I'm he. Yeah, I'm the one you're looking for. They took him and they beat him unmercifully. And then finally they nailed him to the cross. And he hung there and he suffered one of the first things he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But he died. That man said about that lamb, he said, that lamb died so I said, I don't ever want to kill another lamb. What? You? Where is your heart? Jesus did that for you. If you die in your sins, he said, where I am, you can't come. There should be nothing more important than responding to the Lamb of God that hang out on Calvary and shed his blood for you and me. I'd be afraid to be ashamed and ashamed to be afraid. We're going to sing. We just need one more verse, brother. That's one more verse. And if you're here, wherever you are, you need to come on out. Tomorrow is not promised to you. You're not guaranteed that you're going to wake up in the morning. You know, things happening, all kind of stuff, blowing up, how everything's happening. Don't risk your soul over whatever it may be, and nothing more important than your soul. Jesus thought so, came all the way from heaven, died, shed his blood to cleanse you, and the water is ready. The blood will be applied to your soul when you go down the water of grave of baptism. And when you come up, your soul will be cleansed and the Lord will add you to the way. You'll be in the way to heaven. Live faithful unto death and you'll have an eternity to rejoice. I poured out my heart to you and we're going to sing another verse. I believe there are some here almost persuaded. You have to be mighty hard hearted not to be persuaded. But when you walk forward, if you make a step, the Lord will help you. Oh yes, he will. If you don't want to come forward, the devil will help hold you still. And who are you going to go with? The Lord or the devil? We shall see. Another verse, brother. Our blessed Lord fills it none who would to him. Won't you come? If you come, some others might come. Oh, may the work is done. The work is done. Be saved. Oh, tonight. Oh, why not tonight? Oh, why not tonight? Not tonight. Will thou be saved? Will thou be saved? Then why? Oh, why not tonight? Thank you, Brother Brinkley. Been good to be here. Looking forward to tomorrow night, Thursday night. Hard to believe, just two nights left. But I uh, heard Brother Brinkley say one time, I was listening to a CD, he said uh, there were a lot of folks there and it was a Wednesday night service, and he said, that's okay if you sneak away from your home congregation, just as long as you're back on Sunday. <laughs> So we won't, we won't tell on you if you're here tomorrow night. But it's been good to have everybody here again. We want to welcome any visitors. Uh, Brother Brinkley was saying something while ago. It reminded me of one of my favorite quotes of Marshall Keeble that I read in his biography. He said, uh, he said, if you're not ashamed, come. And if you are ashamed, then just stay where you are because God can't use you anyways. We need folks that are not ashamed of the Lord. We've heard the truth presented this week, and we're going to hear more of it tomorrow night, Lord willing. And Thursday night, we appreciate Brother Brinkley for that. Final song? 536. 536. And then we'll have our closing prayer. Again, thank you for being here. 536. Verses 1 and 5. Let's sing it. To Canaan, to land, I'm on my way where the soul never dies. My darkest night will turn to day where the soul never dies. No sad farewells, no tears.
Would you bow with me, please? Dear Holy Father in heaven, we're indeed so grateful for this beautiful day and for all the blessings that come from your mighty hand. We're thankful, dear Father, for your son Jesus. We're so thankful for the precious blood that he was willing to shed on our behalf, and we pray that we would live every day of our lives in a way that would show you that appreciation. Dear Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity to be here tonight to hear a powerful message from your word. We pray that we would apply it to our lives and that we would go out into this darkened world that we might be a shining light to all those that we come in contact with. Dear Father, we pray that you would be with us as we dismiss from this place. Guide, guard, and direct our footsteps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.